So this, this is being recorded. Um, if you don't know, Monday night classes, this, a lot of classes, we record them. Uh, Dan edits them, puts them on our YouTube page, so you can go back, you can refer to it, you can send, send it to somebody else who's maybe interested in the topic. So just to let you know. And that will include access to the handout. If you got a handout when you came in, uh, there's some extras back there on the stool, but it should have been on all the chairs. Uh, the, Dan's going to work his magic, and the handout will be accessible as well on the, on the site. All right, so I'm going to just start with a little bit of introduction and background. This is one of the most common refrains among scholars of Bible, theologians, is it's complicated, right? It's complicated. When people debate uh, Roe v. Wade and so forth, bumper stickers don't do it. Pro-life, pro-choice, well, it's complicated. Uh, and this is complicated. Now, for some fundamentalist Christians, when they hear it's complicated, they see that as a kind of cover for anything progressive. Oh, yeah, sure, it's going to be complicated. But I honestly think that recognizing the complexity of an issue does more justice, is more fair reading of Scripture than just saying, well, the Bible says. So we're going to look at the complexity of the issue. Uh, the title might seem a little cute, LGBTQ and the B-I-B-L-E, and it might sound, therefore, like it's simplistic and so forth. That's not at all what is meant by that. I think both aspects, Bible and the issue of sexuality, are complicated. So the children's line has this, this uh, song has this line, though. Any of you grew up singing this? I stand alone on the Word of God, which actually is probably not true. The Protestant reformers they had this phrase, sola scriptura, scripture alone. But in reality, none of us, not even fundamentalists, read the Bible alone. There's no way to do that. And we'll, I'll show you how uh, there, it's a more complex issue. As for the sexuality, LGBTQ does not even begin to exhaust that subject. Some of you would know that a lot of times you'll see this phrase, LGBTQIA+. It indicates the complexity of this issue. Beyond lesbian and gay and bisexual and transgender and queer, this notion of intersexuality, of asexuality, but also the plus, which just simply indicates there's more. There's so much variety. And some communities, some persons, are comfortable letting the, the word queer, which has gone under so many transformations over the years, to kind of be an umbrella term. But others, eh, they're not quite as comfortable with that term. But reading the Bible, like sexuality, is complicated. So what we're doing as a church, and you see it on this handout, is at the top is a statement. And we're exploring what it means to become open and affirming, officially open and affirming, part of a group that recognizes congregations as opening and affirming. So it's this designation that not only welcomes all persons of various sexualities, and that's where you get this word open, but fully accepts them. And, and so you have this notion of affirming. There are a few places in Christianity where people are, they're welcome to come, but they are not affirmed in that. Um, and so our congregation has been um, in talks and within the lay leadership, but also with this Alliance Q, which is part of our denomination. And what does it mean to become open and affirming? Well, there's a process. Um, we don't take congregational votes because of our size and our polity. And so our board, lay leaders, clergy have been working on this process for some time. But they, they ran out of their uh, office, so to speak, midsummer, and so the new board comes in. And this has been an ongoing discussion. Uh, and so we have this statement. And that statement, if you've had a moment to just read it or have read it previously, does not fit on a bumper sticker. You, right? It's complicated. So in the midst of the list of persons there that we want to welcome, and it's a long statement, the obvious ones that we're talking about today are sexual orientation and gender identity. So in all of the board's discussions and in every conversation, we've, it's been very clear that we are overwhelmingly in favor of that. That's been very clearly made. But I started thinking about it. There are a lot of people who claim Christian faith 
and who are totally fine with that but don't have the vocabulary and when their cousin at Thanksgiving says well you know you can pray them out of that and whatever they don't know how to talk about it and so really my intent is to kind of give you a vocabulary and a way to think about this um, in conversation hopefully not debate but you know sometimes it's debate so I hope I can help you with that so we'll start with the B-I-B-L-E which is definitely not a simple thing um, First thing I would just say is, it's not a book. It's a library of books. There's 66 of them. They're written by different authors over different periods. They do not always agree on everything, and that's true even regarding sexuality. So David Jensen, and he's one of the books that's listed there on the thing, has this great quote. The oft-heard question, what does the Bible say about sex, is related to the equally important question, how do we read the Bible? So we're going to talk about that. It's technically called hermeneutics. You, you get the word for free. I usually charge tuition for that. But <laughs> So with regard to sexuality and many other topics, I coined this term years ago. I think a lot of people use what's called a hermeneutics of convenience. I'll show you what I mean. Here's a verse from the Apostle Paul. Let a woman learn in silence with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silent, for Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Okay, that's 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. Many people will take that passage literally. They do not in their church let women teach. We don't have that position. We have a female senior minister. We clearly reject that. But I heard a woman scholar, fundamentalist woman scholar, say, well, women can teach boys in Sunday school, but when they turn 18, they, she can't. And I said, where did you get that? And she said, well, at 18, they've become a man, and so the woman can't have instruction over the man, but maybe for the boy. Well, you hear what she's doing. She's doing a hermeneutic convenience. This is her view. I said, well, you know, in the first century, 13 is when you became a man. Well, I just didn't want to talk about that. <laughs> so, again, it's complex, and you can't just read literally. But here's where it gets interesting. Okay, notice where we are. 1 Timothy 2, verse 11 through 14. Now we're just prior to it. Same passage, same author. Women should dress themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothing, not I hope nobody has their hair braided in the room. <laughs> or with gold, pearls, or expensive clothes, but with good works, as is proper for women who profess reverence for God. So how can somebody take the same letter, the same author, and next verses right next to each other and say, you see, the Bible says women shouldn't do this, but those women braid their hair. So what they've done is they've exercised a hermeneutics of convenience. I'll take this verse, don't want that one. I'll take that one, don't want this one. That's a hermeneutics of convenience. So something similar happens in law, and we hear this a lot. Um, when we hear about different readings of the Constitution, originalists, this is what it says, this is what it meant, versus revisionists who say, well, yeah, that's what it meant, but the times have changed, and what does this mean in our day? So this is the same kind of thing that biblical scholars are doing. Christianity does not have a Supreme Court that gets to decide for everyone, although, as I noted there, there are some people who've appointed themselves judges. Um, and I think about these horrible stories coming out of Iran where the women are protesting this mandatory wearing of the hijab. Okay, so one of the key questions in this hermeneutics or this study of the Bible is, what in the Bible still applies? If you say, well, come on, braiding of hair, jewelry, that, how do you decide what still applies and, and what you know, needs to be interpreted in context? So here's an example. Five times in his letters, Paul instructs, actually commands believers in the assembly to greet one another with a holy kiss. Well, actually, two weeks ago, I was doing communion at 10 o'clock. I don't remember who it was, but she was serving with me. Her husband came forward, and they kissed. And I said, we were whispering among ourselves, I go, I will not be kissing her. I just want you to know that. <laughs> but, I mean, 
we don't do that. We don't do that. We found other ways in our culture to say, well, you know, a handshake and a hug probably will suffice. We don't need to take this literally. So we're always looking for these dynamic equivalents. So when we speak of context, we really need to speak about two. We need to speak about Paul's, Matthew, Jesus, all those contexts, but we also need to think about ours. So among the rabbis, Jesus was a rabbi, they called this binding and loosing. They believed in written tradition and oral tradition. And so the rabbis would say, well, yeah, uh, Rabbi so-and-so said this, and this verse said this, but uh, I don't know that that's binding anymore. And Jesus does this. People don't realize that he does this. But he, on the Sabbath, the topic of Sabbath, he said, you know, there are times that just doesn't apply. And he wasn't even talking about human life. It was the life of a donkey that fell in a ditch. You could violate Sabbath to help this donkey out. So there was, and then, as I put here, in debate with the Pharisees, Jesus has his take on the debate about divorce, which is one of those topics in our list if you let that be under marital status. Some churches would say, you know, we, you're not welcome if you're divorced. It's hard to even imagine that, but it is. So a similar principle in the 19th century, people wrestled with slavery. Yes, they would look at the exodus, the Egyptian bondage. It was wrong for the Israelites to be slaves, and yet you turn to the New Testament, Paul doesn't just kind of put up with slavery. He says, hey, if you're a slave, stay that way. And then what's really abhorrent is that those passages of master and slave and a lot of the so-called Paul epistles are right next to how husbands and wives are to relate. And that, that's a really dangerous comparison. So one of my colleagues used to say, he was a professor of Hebrew Bible, when someone comes to me and says, well, what about traditional biblical values of the family? And his response was, seriously, you want to have your values of family be what's in the Bible? There's Abraham lying about his wife, Sarah, so that she can sleep with this Pharaoh. I mean, it's like, seriously? And there's incest, and there's rape, and there's, there's multiple wives, there's concubines. That's not real. It's not realistic. So the church is always having to interpret the ancient context and ours. So when it comes to sexuality, specifically same sex, there are these so-called seven passages that if we had three hours, four hours, five hours, I would dive into that. But I'm really glad that one of the resources that's on the handout is by David Lose. He's a really good scholar. And this piece that he wrote for the Huffington Post went viral. And so it's been re, um, kind of brought up to date a little bit. And it's on this website of day one. It is so good a treatment of the so-called seven passages that actually do not deal with what we would know today as same-sex relationships. They deal with hospitality. They deal with sexual violence. They deal with all kinds of things. And so it's really good for anybody who's like struggling with that or if you have someone in your family who says, well, the Bible clearly says. No, it, it, it doesn't. Um, and I just put one example here on the page, and that is there are passages in the New Testament that some translations have translated a Greek word into English as homosexual. It's not a translation. It is not what the word means. It's not what the word says. The, the, the little word H-O-M-O -O, is a Greek word. They could use it if they had wanted to use it. That's not the word. Um, most people believe that what Paul was referring to was older men abusing younger boys in the Roman baths and that this was a violent act. Um, so again, it's an excellent article. There is though one passage that we're going to look at that I think bears on our situation the most direct. I think it is the best passage to deal with this and it has in it sexuality, it has religion, and it even deals with how do you read scripture. The passage is in Acts chapter 8 when Philip encounters this man from Ethiopia. This passage has been used for a long time in studies of Acts to say, look at how the gospel transcends nationality. And that's true. It's there. I mean, he's clearly identified as Ethiopian. 
but there's also sexuality at work. And that has kind of been minimized, probably because the church, I know this will come as a shock, the church, capital C, gets a little nervous talking about sexuality. So I'm going to summarize, because it's a long story, I'm going to summarize kind of key talking points in it, but feel free, go back, read Acts chapter 8. So an angel or a messenger of God directs this deacon named Philip to a remote desert location. What's happening here is that this direction from God is doing something new. This is new in the book of Acts, to go outside. And I think what's fascinating is the apostles, so a.k.a. the clergy of the first century, are not the ones doing this. A deacon in the first century is a layperson. And this layperson is doing what the apostles are not, going beyond the bounds where the church has not been. He encounters this, unfortunately, nameless man from Ethiopia, which at the time would be considered the ends of the earth because that's outside the Roman Empire. And he has supposedly been to the temple in Jerusalem to worship, and he's returning. Um, it's unclear. There's, it's a big debate. Is he a Gentile or is he a Jew? He could be a Jew who is from Ethiopia. But here's the point. He was seeking after God, although it's probably not likely he got in. Um, there were these different courts within the temple. And if he got in, maybe it would be in the outer court, but I'm not even sure he would get in there, and, and that's because of what we learn about him next. He's further identified as a eunuch and an official in a royal court where he served. Now, I put quotation marks because both of those things need interpretation. The first one, I think we know the meaning of that word, it's castration. But the second one, very misleading, to use official for this, because what official meant was he has also been mutilated or dismembered. And the whole point being because he's serving in a court and he can then be trusted, he won't have sex with the queen. Um, but this would prevent him, being a circumcised person, it would prevent him from going into the temple. So here's a verse. I'm guessing this is not your favorite memory verse. <laughs> No one whose testicles are, are crushed or whose penis is cut off shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. I would like to see that one on a bumper sticker, but <laughs> so far, it's not happening. Moreover, they, archaeologists have discovered a sign outside the temple that read this, No foreigner is to enter within the court. Whoever is caught will have himself to blame for his subsequent death. They actually had bouncers gatekeepers at the temple. And this sign was to warn them off, but foreigners and those who were impure, in this case, this castration, this dismemberment, would disqualify him from entering the temple. And people say, well, how did they check? They raised their skirt, their toga. The Spirit of God tells Philip to join the man in his chariot. The language in Greek, though, implies this kind of approaching and drawing close. There's an intimacy here. This is a powerful image. And the man who was seeking after God in Jerusalem is now seeking by reading the prophet Isaiah. So that's what he's doing. He's in his chariot. He's reading the prophet. Philip's supposed to go up and join him. And the guy said, when he, Philip says, well, do you understand what you're reading? He says, well, I, I need someone to guide me. So interpretation is best done in community with varying meanings debated. This is what, part of what we're doing. The passage that he's reading from Isaiah just happens to be about sheep led to slaughter and about a lamb before the shearer. Let that sink in for a moment. A further identification is the lowliness of this person who is denied justice. Okay, so that's what's in the Isaiah text that he's reading. The man asks, it's a great question, is Isaiah referring to himself or does this refer to someone else? Well, what the church will do with this and has, it's from Isaiah 52, they'll say, well, this is about the life of Jesus and the lowliness, better translated, humiliated. But here's the really backstory that's going on. We can easily imagine what this might say to the man who has been cut off. There's images of shearers 
in this passage and who has been humiliated. So the scripture then can both speak to Isaiah's day, to Jesus' day, to this man's day. And this is what biblical interpretation always has to keep doing is saying how do we keep up with the context. So Philip explains about the life of Jesus. The man sees water and he says, what prevents me from being baptized? That is such an odd thing. People in church don't usually say, what prevents me? They say, well, when can I be baptized? Or how do you do baptisms? Why is he saying what prevents me? Because that's been his whole life. His whole life is being prevented. It's, it's his religious experience. I love this though. The preventing is a favorite term of Luke. There's a Greek word that he uses there. I always, this isn't the Greek, I always translate it the kibosh. You know that word? They put the kibosh on him. So when the disciples, the moms are coming with the little kids and they try and stop them, and Jesus says, don't put the kibosh on the little kids. Let them come. The disciples try to put the kibosh on Gentiles. Well, this, this man, this man from Ethiopia who was a eunuch, who was mutilated, he has been kiboshed his whole life. He knows kibosh. But this is the best part. The last word in the Greek, English, the syntax is a little messed up. The last word in the Greek is unhindered. No more kibosh. All of the things throughout Acts that could hinder are, in theory, now unhindered. That's what we would hope. And then Philip does not answer the man's question. But if you open a Bible and you look at a footnote, there's a verse that got inserted by later editors. Not surprising. In those accounts, Philip responds, what prevents you? Well, if you believe with all your heart, you may, or as it says in Greek, it's allowed. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I think the list of if statements that have been put on people for 2,000 plus years. Well, you, you can't if, 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 if. So what does happen, that little piece that I just said, it's not in the best manuscripts. What does happen is fellow doesn't need to answer it. They go into the water. The man's baptized. It's possible the man goes into the, because he's the one that's baptizing him. But some people think, well, you know, it might be a, an act of uh, kind of solidarity with the man as well. And then, just a kind of footnote, two chapters later, Acts 10, something very similar will happen when the Apostle Peter and a Roman soldier named Cornelius, and just to let you know, Paul talks more about food than sex. So for all the times that people say, well, Jesus doesn't even talk about it, and Paul's obsessed with it, well, yeah, but he's more obsessed with food. But here's the point. In that passage, Peter will learn that the kosher laws of Leviticus, so the a book of the Bible that says this is clean, this is unclean. Nope, doesn't apply. No such thing as unclean. Well, Scripture's getting rewritten. The New Testament is rewriting something there. So you can't just take a verse, your, your, your cousin who says, well, the Bible says, well, yeah, the Bible says a lot of things. All right, so this is kind of an odd thing, but I need to make this clear. I would guess that you may have thought that the words biblical and theological are synonyms. They're not. Biblical is what it means to read the Bible. Theological is a bigger picture. It's a kind of drawback to looking at something bigger than the Bible, but including the Bible. So I'll show you what I mean. So I referenced this earlier, the children's song, Stand Alone. Not, not true. Um, in part, <laughs> because... The Bible doesn't address everything. So you can't stand alone on it and talk about certain topics in our day. Some, somebody find chapter and verse about global warming. I mean, you, you're not going to do that, or gene therapy. When it comes to sexuality, there is nothing in Scripture about couples watching erotic videos. There's nothing in there about sex toys. There's nothing in there about cross-dressing, masturbation. And here's what I find interesting. Sitcoms and news stories, and magazines, and conversations. People talk about these things, 
The Bible doesn't because it was written in its context, but what's sad is the church hasn't talked about these things. So we'll let, you know, the sitcom talk about it, but we're not going to talk about it. And I think I can explain why here in a minute, although you probably already know why. All right, so here's what it means to do theology. We really draw on four sources. It's called the Wesleyan Quadrilateral. Some other names goes by, but basically here's what it is. Scripture, we've been talking about that, the two testaments, right? But we also draw on tradition, the variety of perspectives that scholars have taught through the ages. We also use our brains, <laughs> right? Um, when you think about the hermeneutics of convenience and the woman who says, well, you know, a woman can teach boys, but not a man when he turns 18. She's using her brain. She's not using scripture. And then we also use experience, what a person or group has encountered. So what's interesting about the quadrilateral is everybody who claims Christian faith is moving around in the quadrilateral. All your life, you move around the quadrilateral. And on whatever topic it is, we could just throw a topic out and you start talking, you will talk in the quadrants. You will just move around. And sometimes we will say, well, the Bible says, and other times we'll say, yeah, I know, I don't, I don't really like that verse, but here's why. There's a tradition that says, and theologians have noted, and then we move to using our brain, and we move around fluidly, not recognizing how we weight them at different times as well. So it just shows you how complicated it gets. So let me show you what I mean with regard to sexuality and the quadrilateral. We've been talking about scripture, so let me start with tradition. So this is a variety of perspectives that have been taught through the ages. So for instance, Gnostics, early, early, early heresy in the church. You, you know this word, by the way, because you know the word agnostic, which means no knowledge. Well, Gnostics said, we've got knowledge, we've got secret knowledge. And one of the things you should know, secret knowledge is, flesh is evil. Spiritual things are good, flesh is evil. Well, that's a heresy. I mean, if nothing else, God created people with flesh, and Jesus took on flesh. So this has to be declared a heresy. But you can see how that has continued in some views of sexuality. Probably the most influential voice, though, would be St. Augustine. St. Augustine had a very complicated theology. He had a pretty much complicated inner life, too. I mean, he had a concubine. He said, Lord, make me pure, but not yet. That was a... <laughs> I, I, I got to hand it to him for that one. I mean, that's, that's pretty, pretty honest. But he, he thought that we were born sinful because we were born through the procreative act. And so born through a sexual act made us impure. And, and the child was also born in the woman. And of course, the woman is the one who sinned first. And so you get this notion that comes down through the ages. And, and uh, you know, we could add to that uh, the Puritan influence. You know the definition of Puritanism is the haunting notion that somebody somewhere might be happy. And so <laughs> Puritans are all about what's called asceticism, the denial of pleasure. Not just sexual, but just denial of pleasure. But I wanted to just put briefly Abelard and Heloise. Um, Catholic uh, priest slash theologian in the 12th century. Um, Heloise was a nun. They fell in love. They wrote openly about the eroticism between them. And this was a different note in tradition, but a very minor note compared to the anti. And they took care of him by castrating him anyway. So, you know, tradition has come down to us with varied voices, but mostly negative towards sexuality. Um, reason. I would guess you know this, but maybe not. Drawing on scientific knowledge, we know that persons don't exist in a binary way. With regard to gender, it's a scale. This is why that complicated formula has things on it like under plus, but also with regard to attraction. The, the notion that people are gay or straight, it, it ignores the fact that some people who are so-called straight might have attractions in varying degrees on this scale. We know that, 
from science. That's in this branch of the quadrant of reason. And some people, well, when they move around the quadrant, they're willing to use reason at some places, but not this one. This is what I meant about that moving around. And then experience. What a person or group has encountered in their lives. A relative or close friend comes out, and all of a sudden, their theology, the quadrant, changes. Maybe. Maybe not. So, what we're really doing here is not just navigating Scripture, but the other three areas of the quadrant. So, I want to just draw attention to two phrases on here that are not the ones that you would think, although I think they're crucial, the sexual orientation and gender identity. And I, I couldn't help myself. I just thought, why is it that, you know, looking at the list, if someone was troubled, it, they probably wouldn't be saying, well, now, wait a second. We're going to welcome people regardless of age? I mean, nobody's sitting around going, I don't know if we should let young people in. I don't know if we should let old people in, you know? Um, so clearly, we, we could talk about that. But the phrase that I absolutely love is that this is couched in regard to our table. Because our denomination is a table-oriented <coughs> weekly communion, I love that it's couched this way that everyone is welcome to the table, the open communion table at our very heart, it says. And it makes me think, well, who deserves to eat in this world? I mean, when I look at this list, is there somebody who probably just shouldn't be allowed to eat? And I also think about this great passage in Acts. You can look this one up, Acts 27. Paul's on a ship with Roman sailors, it's not looking good. There's a big storm. And he says, you're going to need to take some food. It'll, it'll save you. I mean, they translate it survive, but it'll save you. And he, he takes bread and he blesses it and he breaks it and he gives it, which is the exact same language of communion in the upper room with Jesus. And these are Roman sailors. These aren't, you know, we would use that pejorative term pagan. They're, they're not people in the family of God, at least as it was perceived at the time. So this is a powerful image. And the other line is the, and this may be the most important thing I want to say, as God has welcomed us is the last phrase in this long, long statement. Did you notice that? As God has welcomed us. This is a radical shift. It is not, and I'm using this phrase so-called straight, because remember we exist on this, on this uh, continuum. It's not that so-called straight people decide, you know what? Out of the goodness of our heart, we're going to let in. Because what you do then is you've, you've made something normative and anything else not normative. But even if you do that, and it is so-called generous, you totally have missed the point. The only way people get in, wherever they are on the continuum, is because God welcomes us. It's God's church. We're not voting to say, well, are we going to be accepting it's this is a, a radical shift and, and the uh, the last book on the list there and I have the books over here if you want to look at them afterwards really drives this point home and it's a crucial point welcoming people into church is not generous on our part it's recognizing the generosity of God who welcomes all people that's big uh, there's one more though I, I thought about and it's kind of embedded there near the very end as well, or theological perspective. We're going to welcome people who have different theologies. So I don't know if you remember this. Some of you would. When the disciples as a denomination moved to full acceptance of same-sex persons, the general minister then and the president, I mean, it's the same person, but the person who was then general minister and president sent out a pastoral letter. And I thought it was just brilliant what she did. She said, people are asking, well, what does this mean? Well, it means that all persons are welcome. LGBTQ, they're all welcome. And they said, well, what if we don't believe that all persons should be welcome? Well, you're welcome too. That is such a brilliant pastoral move. Now, you, you know, of course, that some people said, no thanks. We're out of here. But this is what theologians would call a hermeneutic of love. 
that instead of building a hermeneutics that's, I'm going to bring my theology with me and I'll figure it out and I'll dance around this quadrilateral until it works, is to say, well, over the quadrilateral is this hermeneutic of love and this hermeneutic of acceptance. Okay, so I've marched through this pretty quickly, which is good because we can have some discussion. Um, just again, just to tell you that I, I put a annotated bibliography down here, so just to kind of give you a clue, I probably should have said mm, this one's a little more technical and this one's a little more, you know, because sometimes theologians like to write over people's heads. But um, so I've, I've tried to give you a little bit of a clue as to what you're going to find. You know, you can always on Amazon, you know, you can open the book and start reading and see or not you can handle it, but you can also look at them. Um, and then the whole point of this is for us to have discussion. And if you don't feel comfortable asking or saying something in here, you can say something to me or to Jennifer, who's the chair of the board, or to other uh, persons on leadership and give us feedback or questions, whatever you want. But I do want to open it up and see what you're thinking or questions that you might have. Is this going to be like sixth grade health class where, <laughs> and these are the boy parts and these are the girl parts. I just want to say when you talked about when family members came out, that uh, for our freedom, it wasn't, it, their children came out, they were very much judgmental, but when their grandchildren, <laughs> yes. they loved it. Yeah, I have seen that. Um, I don't know if you all heard that, but. He said sometimes it's not when a child comes out because there are a lot of people for him that's really hard, but their grandchildren and that sometimes uh, tips the... Uh, yeah, I was in a discussion, almost debate one time with a gentleman and I said, you know what, I don't really want to debate this because you're going to change your mind someday. And he said, no, I'm not. And I said, well, what if your granddaughter is gay? And you could tell he got... He caught himself. He was like, he'd never considered that possibility. But that doesn't mean that uh, all grandparents have accepted either. So, yeah. Thank you for that, though. Mike, I really like the policy, the concept. One of the things as a nitpicking lawyer, <laughs> as soon as you start listing, you inevitably live leave something off the list that, that you hadn't thought of. So have you thought of one? No. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just saying you no, don't no. need to. I, no, I appreciate that. Um, one of the things that was raised in one of the listening sessions, because there were people invited to the board and so forth, was uh, that very thing. There's a kind of the danger of when you list, you leave something off. But also someone said, and this is sort of the other side of it, well, why do we have to list? Why couldn't we just say all are welcome? Well, I think two answers to that. Uh, one is there are so many churches that say all are welcome and do not mean it. Or all are welcome but don't affirm it. But the other reason is, you know, and this is a great example in Paul. He writes, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither male nor female, there's neither slave nor free. Well, why didn't he just say everybody's accepted? And, and, of course, this is a complicated issue, too, because the reality is you don't want to say that their identity as Jew or Greek doesn't matter anymore. But what he's saying is the distinction between them doesn't need to matter. You can still celebrate who they are. But the point being, by naming them, you recognize the issues that he was dealing with. At the time, oh, yes, there was Jew and Greek. Oh, yes, there was. And so um, it's, it's kind of important to, to name that. Yes? Yep. Or, and he said, for more practical reason, I think a, some kind of list actually does have to be included. Some of that language has to be included to be a passing over. Yes, right. True. Yeah, good point. Yeah. So I think one of the difficulties is the part of the quadrangle that has to do with what's going on around you now that's so fluid uh, that uh, 
I mean, I remember it doesn't seem like that long ago that we were talking about being an open and affirming congregation, but we really didn't know what that meant. I mean, this, this isn't something that's happened over generations. It's something that's happened over a 10-year period. Mm -hmm. And so at what point does society embrace uh, to the point where you can make a, a solid decision? Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, nobody knows the answer to that, but one of the things that strikes me is that society, if we can say this, and it's a broad brush stroke to say it, that society has moved toward more acceptance. I think that's a pretty fair estimate, and you can demonstrate that. But one of the things I recognized was that people who have a progressive view on sexuality don't necessarily have a vocabulary. They just say, yeah, I just, I don't know, I just, and, and they kind of might even feel a little bit of cognitive dissonance, like they're in a bind. They're a person of faith who's perfectly fine with this, but they have old tapes going through their head of the preacher who, well, the preacher who was always thumping his Bible and was preaching against the gays. My theory, by the way, is that some of those people on that continuum aren't as straight as they think, but I think the the idea that the society has moved but they don't have the vocabulary and so they feel the the bind with the old tapes and they also feel the bind with their bible that they don't know what to do with the bible because it seems to on the surface which it doesn't really con condemn all of these things i think i saw a hand here my as a former teacher i listened to the uh, discussion in the news and i am so thankful i didn't teach in the in an age where you didn't know what gender to use or what pronoun, and, and even on applications now, what, what, what do you wish to be addressed by? I, I, would, I would be always <laughs> standing there wondering, what are they? I mean, I, I truly think we've made it so difficult in so many ways. Well, we made it difficult, but what we're really doing is not making it difficult. We're just recognizing the complexity. And we have to, it's kind of, this isn't the perfect analogy, but when new technology comes out, we evolve. We don't always want to evolve. I would love to go back to a simple way of technology. But I think the same thing. We have to keep evolving. And it's, it's, a, it's work, but it's not that we made it difficult. We just recognized the complexity of it. Yes? How does the Catholic Church deal with the abuse of the hierarchy I mean, to set this all by them? Uh, wow. Well, what does God look at that? Well, I mean, there was a cover-up, obviously, as we all know. And but then they're leading the masses to yeah. their beliefs. Right. Well, and, and to be fair, the Catholic faith has tradition and scripture as very, very important, almost pretty much equally, uh, depending on who's pope at the time or the bishop. But not all Catholics, of course, subscribe to the same thing, with, same with communion or with sexuality or anything else. So I'm always a little hesitant when we talk about the Catholics, you know, or that'd be like saying, well, what do Protestants believe? We well, should actually change that, too. It's prevalent in other churches. Yes, true. Not just Catholics. Well, yeah, I mean, the Southern Baptist Convention just was dealing with this as well, cover-ups. All right, so as I mentioned, feel free to email, uh, set up an appointment, talk to anybody, come up, talk to me, look at the books, um, talk amongst yourselves. I mean, this is what it means to do church and community, and uh, thank you for being a part of this. So. Thank you.